If you smoke weed, then you will be dumb. No, I'm just kidding, actually. However, the implications of smoking weed on a developing teenager's brain is a lot more concerning than just the possibility of that individual ending up dumb. Stay tuned to find out why. Here with the detail, Ramon Phipps. <laughs> Children and teenagers smoking weed or just intaking the use of THC products in general is not a good idea whatsoever. There are a lot of reasons, however, I'm just going to focus on a few in today's video. In looking at today's topic, I really want us to understand the foundations of the brain and how the brain is going to be changing over the course of psychoactive drug use. I deal with addicts a lot. So that's my line of work and it's a big huge reason as to why I wanted to make this video in the first place because a lot of addicts, they do have children. And a lot of addicts, they learn their addictive behaviors from their caregivers, from their social environments. And with that understanding, we need to be able to really start to think about our own personal influences on our younger audiences. So, smoking weed, why is it actually bad for a teenager to smoke weed? Well, there is one very, very, very big scientific reason that we cannot avoid, which is neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is more than just a reason to not smoke weed. It's actually a very specific type of change that happens in the brain, especially in reference to our coping mechanisms. What is a coping mechanism? Well, it's a tool, it's an activity that we utilize to handle, manage, and persevere through a stressful situation. Imagine this now, you're a child and you're experiencing the world for the first time. You go into kindergarten and you get your favorite teddy bear ripped away from you. You have stress at that moment in time. You are in high school and you're worried about your grades and you're very shameful about that C plus that you just got on your math test. That is a stressful situation. Or maybe you find yourself getting pushed up against the locker over and over again, just being bullied at school. These are very stressful situations. But stress is necessary in our life. There's no way that we're gonna be able to avoid stress. However, how we deal with that stress is very important because our brain, our body, our mind, and our emotions will learn repetitive behaviors if we continue a certain action. So what is neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity is the way that your brain changes to meet new conditions. Now, now that we know that stress will be present within your life, we know we can't avoid stress. So what is the benefit of stress for a developing human brain? As a child, your brain is not done developing until about 21 to 25 years old. I know that my body wasn't developing, done developing up until I wanna say 25, 26 years old. That's when I was able to finally start to grow in a full beard. But your brain, you're not always able to see that guy. You're not always able to witness his changes, but things are happening behind the scenes, whether you like it or not. If you experience stressful moments, stressful episodes throughout the course of your upbringing, whether you're a little child and a baby, or you're now coming of age in your high school years, this stress and your response to stress is so necessary because this is gonna create habits for you in the future, in your adult years. If I experience stress as a child, and my go-to is to smoke weed, to use a drug to escape the pain. Well, first and foremost, it's common for that to happen. In Ontario alone, 80% of individuals will graduate from high school with using at least one psychoactive substance during their time in high school. Usually this substance is in the form of alcohol. However, with marijuana now legalized in Canada, it's very logical to believe that more and more people will be partaking in the casual use of marijuana. Notice how I highlighted casual here, because casual is where we all start with regarding our psychoactive substance use, whether it's weed, whether it's cocaine, whether it's alcohol, or whatever you're gonna put into your body to change your state of mind. We all start off as a casual user. So, as a child, you go through many hormonal changes, and we all have this this nice little environment in our high schools called a smoker's corner. In my school, it was called the smoker's pit. It was a literal ditch away from the school across the street. 
But we all see the smokers corner. We all see these little kids killing themselves with cigarettes, just smoking it all the way, trying to be adults way too soon or thinking it makes them cool. But they find that sense of connection and relationship with these other individuals who are choosing to commit to the same actions. Now, why do people commit to these actions, especially if they are so self-destructive? Well, it might have to do with a lot of reasons. It could have to do with external validation that they get from, of course, partaking in the use of these particular substances with other people. It can maybe even be a way for them to practice being something different from what they actually are. What do, you, what do I actually mean by that? Something different from what you actually are. Well, if you're a kid and you feel like you have no control in the world, then smoking a cigarette? Although the statistics are 50% of people are probably going to develop some type of cancer from smoking cigarettes long term, that at least gives you some sense of control over your mortality. Control over the decisions that you make. It makes you feel like you are independent in this world. And as a 16 year old child, independence is probably all you want more than anything else. But that's dangerous. And the reason it's dangerous is because we're not really taking into account what we are actually doing to our mind that's going to create long term problems for us. We need to be able to manage our stress naturally. However, when we introduce a substance into our life, into our body, into our brain, then we are now engaging with this use of a very, very problematic chemical substance that is now changing the way that my body responds to stress. That is not good. That is an issue. Drugs are bad. I was told drugs are bad all my life, honestly. That did not stop me from using them. That did not stop me from, of course, becoming dependent towards them. And that's the second stage that we enter into once we are no longer that casual user. We enter into dependencies. Usually these dependencies starts off being psychological and that's a lot more dangerous than a physiological dependency to a drug or a substance of your choice. Physiological dependencies just happen because our body gets used to certain chemical hooks and without that, our body is not able to function. You usually find this in people that have alcohol use disorder or even opioid use disorder. These drugs in themselves, they latch onto your body's functions and they get used to functioning in those particular ways. So now when you remove those top substances, when you detox, yes, you go through these withdrawal symptoms. However, with marijuana, with weed, with cannabis, whatever you want to call it, with that particular drug in itself, the detrimental effects, you will not see them for a long period of time. However, I guarantee you, you will feel them. You will feel them because you might notice, especially in your adult years, if you've been smoking for a long period of time, that you have problems with your executive function. What is your executive function? Well, in the frontal lobe of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, it houses your ability to make sound decisions. What is a sound decision? Well, you utilize two things, your hindsight thinking and your foresight thinking in order to make the appropriate decision, no matter what it may be for you here in the present. I always love to refer to the present as a mindful moment. However, with a brain that's gone through a lot of dysfunctions, especially in regard to its ability to handle stress, with a brain that's only been introduced to marijuana and different drugs in order to help them manage their anxiety, their depression, their anger and their frustrations of the world, especially if we started at a young age with a brain that's always had this crop that it can rely on, this easy button, this quick fix to just escape the world just for a moment with a brain that is so dependent on these things, psychologically dependent on these things. Then to be able to make a proper choice for ourselves in moments of stress, it'll be hindered. It is hindered at that point. And that's the issue here. The issue is that we as people who were growing up through the course of our teenage years did not give ourselves the opportunity to actually manage the stresses of life naturally. We used a drug or we used to drink. Therefore then our brain got conditioned to need this drug or this drink or whatever substance in your body in order to just manage its issues in life. And these issues can be something very small. They can be something very large. Usually when an adult looks at a child's issues going through high school, we can always say and throw judgment that all you have to do is wake up and go to school. You get to hammer friends or play video games. You don't know what real responsibility is. But in that coming of age period of our life, we go through so much hormonal changes. There's already a lot going on within our brain and our biochemistry. And when we add substances to that, 
normalcy or what we call homeostasis, that balance, that neurological and hormonal balance becomes harder and harder for our body to maintain because there's all these influxes of dopamine, of serotonin, and every different neurochemical that comes with the drugs that we put into our body, especially as a response to the stresses in our life. If you're afraid, so you smoke weed. If you're stressed about going home to a very toxic environment, so you smoke weed. If you are anxious at school because you feel like you're standing out, so you smoke weed in order to fit in, then those stresses, you never manage them. You never gave yourself the opportunity. The more and more continuous our use is, the more we psychologically start to latch on to this need to use a substance to manage the hardships in life. To be sober and manage these things, to just be me and manage these things is necessary, especially in those developmental stages. But when I take that opportunity away, I only create a crux in my life for me to go right back to the substance because I know it works. But although it helps me relieve that stress for the short term, it doesn't help me in the long term in the least. In fact, it creates a lot more issues and challenges for me to be able to handle my emotional changes throughout the course of my adult years because no longer is that crux there anymore. If I choose sobriety, if I choose to now say I'm not gonna use drugs or alcohol in order to manage my stresses in life, no longer is that crux there. So imagine this, your baseline in stress tolerance is starting off so low. Heck, it's probably similar to a child in this regard because that baseline, it never had a chance to increase, 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 develop and improve itself from you actually dealing with the stresses of life. Rather, that baseline remains exactly where it is when we start to become those chronic users, moving from the casual to the dependent users, and maybe even for some of us, the addictive users of these substances, be it alcohol, be it marijuana. Self-medicating is never a helpful strategy to be able to manage our stresses. Self-medicating is when we pursue specific behavioral actions, usually in the form of a substance or a stimulus of sort, in order for us to just escape, escape, distract, just soothe ourselves. Self-medicating sounds like a good idea in the moment, oh, I just came back from a long day of work, I just need a bear. Or, oh, we're at a party and I'm feeling anxious. I just need a line to make me feel nice and confident. So all these reasons why we self-medicate ourselves, trust me, they are not good. None of them are. Because again, if you're at a party and you're feeling anxious and you just want to feel more confident and sociable, if you actually worked on that skill, then you will never need something to go up your nose again. But if you choose not to work on that skill and you go right to the quick, easy button fix, then you will always need that substance. And the issue with always needing a substance is that eventually it starts to deteriorate your mind and your body. This is the end goal of all substances that we put in our body that have to do with psychoactive change, specifically the substances that we call drugs or even illicit drugs. These things in themselves are not helpful for us. Now imagine this, I'm so anxious at a party and I want to feel more confident. Well, goddamn, work on it. Work on your confidence, work on your anxiety, work on your depression, work on your shame, work on that self-esteem issue that you may be experiencing so that you can actually grow instead of just put a quick fix into your mind, an easy pill in order to change your psychoactive state for the moment. Because these things, although they help for the moment, it doesn't help in the long run. Rather, it actually makes you weaker, more sensitive, and creates a lot more issues for us in the long run. There's no other way that I can really put this, and a lot of people might not agree with this, but marijuana, the same as alcohol, the same as maybe nicotine, the same as caffeine, is a gateway drug. Why do we call these things a gateway drug? Because these drugs all change our psychoactive state. However, they don't necessarily create a lot of physiological or even cognitive detriments to us in the moment. Now, what do I actually mean by in the moment? Because yeah, you could smoke weed and have a panic attack. You could drink and be thrown up over the toilet and everything of the sort, but likely you sleep it off and you feel good the next morning. So in terms of the short-term detriments, they're very minimal, but the long-term detriments in itself. The reason why these things are called a gateway drug is because they can open us up to different options. And these options will become much more enticing because you've already rationalized to yourself that I smoke weed, I get high, I drink, I can get plastered, I got an iron lung, yada, yada, yada. You've already rationalized to yourself 
that you can use substances and you can have fun doing it. And with this rationale, we're gonna find reasons again to just continue to use and use more. But one day, I promise you, for everybody that's young and that's smoking weed under the age of 19 years old in Canada here, because 19 is when it's legal, for everybody that started when they were young, you will eventually get to the point in your life where it's not enough. When it's not enough, you know that things are about to change dramatically. And by saying it's not enough, it doesn't mean you're gonna jump right into cocaine or put in a needle in your arm. I'm not saying that is the case, but when it starts not being enough, then you'll start wanting more. Then that dependency will start to build. Then that addiction will follow suit because it is not enough. And when things are not enough for us, we start to look for ways to fulfill ourselves. So instead of just smoking marijuana, I might find another alternative in alcohol. If I can't do alcohol or it's not my thing, I might find another alternative in something else, such as a depressant drug, like benzodiazepine medication. Maybe I don't wanna get on medications. It's not for me. But how about the other drugs out there that help me feel more confident, like an MDMA or another stimulant such as cocaine? I mean, all it takes is environmental influences to introduce this into our life whether it be from when we were in high school or heck, maybe in your post-secondary years. But these influences, your mind's already geared towards saying yes, because it said yes over and over and over again to the psychological or psychoactive change that you would have already partaken in just from smoking weed. It's already said yes. So your reason and justification to say no is that much more minimal. That's scary because sometimes with drugs away from weed, it just takes one for addiction to happen or for death to occur. I just want to retouch on neuroplasticity just for a moment and maybe end off with this. When our minds, when our brains go through these physiological changes because it's reconditioning itself to suit a new need, such as I am stressed, I need to get rid of this stress. Instead of doing deep breathing, instead of talking to someone, I get my quick fix from a joint. If my brain is now conditioned to follow this, then there's something that you might have to take accountability for that you're experiencing now in your adult days, which might be mental illness, anxiety, depression, possibly even something oriented around a personality disorder. You take yourself away when you put psychoactive substances in your body. THC is what I'm referring to when we're talking about marijuana. You take yourself away from this role, you take yourself away from your capabilities, you take yourself away from the opportunity to improve. And with these changes in themselves, you are now gonna be more susceptible to mental illness, whether it be anxiety, panic disorders, maybe even a developing predisposition towards psychosis-related symptoms the next time you choose to use a psychoactive drug. You put yourself in this category, and this comes from your own actions. So whether you're 14 years old, just starting off with a little bit of curiosity, or 18 years old, and saying, I've been doing it since I was 13 years old, well, it doesn't matter. You can make this option to change right now and give your brain a lot of room and a lot of time to not only repair itself, but improve and get better, maybe even from the past experiences that it had with drug use. I always think that addicts are some of the most amazing people in this world, however, if you don't make that choice for yourself and you allow chronic use of psychoactive substances such as again marijuana thc or alcohol to continue to influence your mind to change the psychoactive state you lose yourself and you will continue losing yourself to refine yourself is going to be a process of you probably having to shake dependencies or even addictions at some point in time in your life and enter into recovery where you're now having to force yourself not to use these things if you want to avoid that future or if that is your current present day condition, there is always a way out. That way out is, of course, not a drug or a drink or any other type of psychoactive escape. It's you making a choice and a decision to say no, to promise to stop. I didn't make that choice when I was younger. I chose to use. I thought that going against the grain, engaging in taboos, never being that person who conformed to society's rules and standards, I thought that was cool. I thought it was the way that I wanted to live. But later on in life, I dealt with the issues. 
and I've seen thousands of people go through that same experience. Some of them made the promise to stop maybe in their 70s, 80s. Some of them made the promise to stop in their 20s, maybe in their teens. Whenever you choose to make the promise to stop, know that there's a hard road in front of you in order to recondition that brain to allow neuroplasticity to one again take place so that it can change itself to meet a new condition. This condition just happens to be a healthier way of living. This is the detail Ramon Phipps. I hope you got something from this talk today. Stay mindful. Hi guys, this is Ramon Phipps with the detail. I sincerely thank you for watching this video today. I very much appreciate it. Every like, comment, share, and subscribe helps this channel grow to its fullest potential. And all you want to do is keep on giving you guys free context. So please go ahead and like, comment, subscribe, and share for content that is focused on guided meditations with breastwork specializations, open topic discussions such as this one with a focus on, of course, mental health and mindfulness content, and of course, educational workshops so that we can better our skills that we preach. Stay mindful, guys.